All right, I've got 302 on my clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Seth Darling. I'm the director of the Center for Molecular Engineering at Argonne National Laboratory. Elena Harkness, the executive director of Current and our usual host, had an unavoidable conflict at this time. So you are all stuck with me as your host uh, for today. I will do my best to fill her highly capable shoes. Uh, on behalf of my fellow Third Coast, Third Coast Water Seminar partners shown here on this slide, I'm pleased to welcome you to our April event. We hold these uh, seminars on uh, typically the last Wednesday of every month uh, in the afternoon and cover all kinds of different topics uh, related to water. So if this is your first Third Coast Water Seminar series, please do join us uh, as the series continues into the future. So uh, as a reminder, the way we um, handle questions is uh, during the, the presentation, please submit any questions for the speaker using the Q&A tab. Uh, I will moderate those after uh, her presentation. If you have any general comments, feel free to post those um, using the chat tab. You will note that this event is being recorded. The recording link will be shared on Current's event page and Current's YouTube channel and will be sent to all of you post-event. So this is the plan for today. Uh, you're hearing the welcome from me at, at, uh, at this time. I will be shortly introducing our speaker who will give uh, roughly a 40 minute presentation uh, followed by Q&A. So please do make sure you post your questions on that Q&A tab so we can get to them at the end. And uh, then we'll wrap up and give you information on the next Third Coast Water Seminar Series. So uh, today we're really happy to have Susanna Shiva here as our speaker. Susanna got her PhD in um, habilitation from Silesian University of Technology in Poland, after which she was a fellow of the Foundation of, uh, for Polish Science, as well as the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation at the Institute for Heavy Ions Research in Germany. Then uh, Susanna came stateside, did a postdoctoral uh, research fellowship at the University of Florida before joining the faculty at the University of California, Irvine in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And she also has an appointment in the chemistry department and I think also in the biomedical engineering department. So uh, she's checking them almost all off. Susanna has won a number of awards, uh, just a few examples. She's a fellow of the Sloan Foundation she won the Bessel Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society and of AAAS. And she won the very prestigious Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. So Susanna got to shake a president's hand. Uh, maybe she'll let us know which one that was because I'm not sure what the year was. Uh, Susanna's current interests are focused on using synthetic nanopores as templates for biomimetic channels as well as ionic diodes and ionic transistors. And I think we're gonna be hearing about that, uh, that work today. So Susanna, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Seth. So let me start with uh, thanking Seth Darling for the invitation. It's a really great privilege and pleasure to be here with you. Uh, so, today, um, so today I would like to tell you a story um, how my group is using uh, single nanopores in different materials to study properties of transport on the nanoscale. Uh, so the experimental setup, which we have been using, is extremely simple. You have a conductivity cell, you have a membrane with a single pore in it. Uh, there is electrolyte on both sides and we measure current. So we actually perform a mostly electrochemical characterization. And what my group is especially interested in is we are interested in tuning not only geometry of these pores, but also surface characteristics. So in the first part, I will tell you about a project which we did a while ago, where we uh, tuned the geometry of the pore and surface chemistry, creating a junction such that the pore behaved like an ionic diode. So it transported ions in one direction, but it really blocked the current almost entirely in the opposite direction. So we created an ionic equivalent, equivalent of a p-n junction in semiconductors. In another part of the project, in another part of the talk, I will tell you about our efforts to make an ionic selective uh, channel. 
Specifically, we made a pore which allowed potassium ions to pass through, but did not allow sodium to pass through. And finally, um, I would like to share with you our newest project in which we uh, attempt to create diodes for water. So not only are we interested in controlling transport of ions and molecules, but also the solvent. I will show you a glimpse how the samples look like. Uh, so we work both with polymer membranes. So we have a fairly large three centimeter in diameter film of polymer. And there is one nanopore in it somewhere in the middle. And then some other experiments were done with silicon nitride chips, so much smaller, much harder to deal with samples, also with one single nanopore, which is drilled um, in the middle or somewhere on the chip. So as you can imagine, our uh, research has been heavily inspired by biology, and it's because all physiological processes of a human body are relying on transport through proteins through, through protein structures called channels and pores, which are embedded in the cell membrane. So every cell is surrounded from the outside world by a membrane. The membrane is only four nanometers thick or four nanometers thin. And these, channel, these channels allow exchange of ions and molecules between inside and outside uh, of the cell. What is really unique about them is that many of them are selective for one particular ion and many of them are gated so that unless you do something to them in a the form of an external stimulus, they will not do anything interesting. Since about 80s, um, it has been possible to address individual channels by measuring current voltage curves. And it became clear that these uh, channels are not omega resistors, but rather they really behave like devices. They can be a rectifier or they can be a diode. They are switches for ions. What also became clear uh, by looking at biology is that um, as much as single channels are amazing with amazing transport characteristics, even more interesting um, behaviors can be obtained if different channels work in concert with each other. And one of the most prominent examples is given by nerve signaling, where uh, you have a very long part of a neural cell through which information has to be uh, transduced without an analysis. We have the nerve signal, which has the form of the action potential. So the, um, is, the, is, the, is the wave of the electrical potential difference which is being created. And all that is possible thanks to, thanks to beautiful cooperation of sodium gated channels and potassium gated channels. So um, I think that we live in a very interesting time when a, a new field is emerging. Sometimes it's called ionic circuits. Sometimes it's called iontronics. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have an example of an integrated circuit um, and definitely integrated circuits and electronics changed our lives entirely. So we think that if we could create integrated ionic circuits, which would be composed of different channels, we could, defini we could definitely revolutionize how we detect molecules, viruses, cells, um, we could think about the new ways of relaying information in a highly dissipative medium of liquid. And the reason why, um, why my group is very interested in nanopores is because we use them as a, as a model system to probe interfaces. And the reason for that is that nanopores have a fairly large surface, but they have very small volume. Therefore, everything which passes through these channels um, has to really interact with the pore walls. And the most um, simplest examples can be provided by charged nanopores. So structures which carry excess positive charge or excess negative charge. And then if you look what's inside these pores, if they are small enough, you will notice that they are filled mostly with ions of the same type. So they can be filled with anions or they can be filled with cations, creating ionic equivalents of, of N-doped or P-doped semiconductors. We can also tune the chemistry a little bit better so that you could imagine attachment of certain recognition agents on the pore walls such that uh, you can create a selective transport through very specific binding um, of these ions and molecules uh, to the groups on the pore walls. So um, 
So we are, so um, my, uh, my group is part of the, of one of the Energy Frontier Research Centers. Um, I'm part of SENT, which is a center for enhanced nanofluidic transport. And that's what we are doing. We are focusing on precision nanostructures. Um, we call them single digit nanopores. We have an effective opening of less than 10 nanometers. Uh, the headquarters are at MIT. Our director is Professor Michael Strano, and uh, Professor Yuhang Wong is our deputy director. So the center is um, organized among uh, three thrusts, um, in uh, which we are interested in emergent confinement effects, um, which happen with solvents. We are interested in ion correlation and modification with solvation of ions if they are forced to enter a very small opening and finally we want to integrate uh, that knowledge and create a new basis for uh, for improved selectivity and separation systems uh, so let me start with uh, telling you about the project which is probably the closest to my heart uh, where we try to make synthetic analogs of biological voltage gated channels so before i go into the details of the of the technique um, or the uh, approach, I would like to tell you a little bit how we make some of the pores. So historically, my group has been using um, nanopores and membranes, which are prepared by so-called track etching technique. Uh, we collaborate with a group in Germany, uh, specifically Dr. Troutman and uh, Tommy Molares at the Institute for Heavy Ions in Darmstadt. So they have capability of uh, irradiating uh, different films, different dielectric films, with heavy ions. Uh, we like working with gold, uranium. These ions were accelerated to total kinetic energy of a uh, few giga electron volts, so they are really energetic. Uh, the nice thing about the facility in Germany is the ability to control the irradiation density so that they can irradiate uh, with as little as one heavy ion per one large uh, sample or with a lot of them up to 10 to the 10 or maybe even up to 11 ions per centimeter square. Uh, the unique feature of the track etching technique of the way how we make the pores is the one-to-one um, -one correspondence between the number of heavy ions which pass through the film and the number of pores which you get. So every heavy ion passing through a film creates a very localized damaged zone which then uh, in Irvine, we can etch to the sizes and, and, and shapes as we want. So we work predominantly with single ion irradiated membranes, um, and we work with pores which are either cylindrical or we work with pores which are conically shaped. We can tune the opening diameter down to a few nanometers. And again, uh, the polymer films that we work with are quite thick, um, are quite thick for us, especially when you compare it with biological systems, and they are 10, at least 10 micrometers um, thick. So how do we know how the pores look like uh, because of their huge aspect ratio? So um, the natural way to look at their sizes and the shapes is through, um, through examining by electron microscopy. And if you have a porous membrane with a lot of pores, you can create cross sections. Uh, but you can also look on top and see how the pores look like. Um, of course, electron beam doesn't um, and, um, doesn't have a huge depth, uh, but you can kind of figure out that the pores should be conically shaped. Um, that the pore in, so this is the pore in Capton, and that's the that's the set of pores in polyethylene terephthalate. But in order to know a little bit better how the pores look like, um, you can also make their metal replica. And these particular wires uh, were obtained by filling these pores with gold. Um, I believe that was done by electroless deposition in this case. You can dissolve the polymer and then you look at metal wires, which are the exact negative of how the pores look like. And they are, you know, I call them cutout like shape, suggests that uh, they are indeed conically shaped as we hoped they would be in this particular case. So um, voltage gated channels um, in biology are the basis of a lot of uh, different processes, and they are definitely uh, very important for nerve signaling. 
and it has been recognized that they have the ability of switch the current on and off in a voltage dependent manner. The, uh, the, the, the mechanism how it occurs is actually fairly complicated. Um, there is a, a part of the channel called electromechanical gate, which physically is opening the port for ionic transport or closing it. So you can think about voltage gated channels as a device which has voltage dependent opening diameter. So when we looked at it, uh, we thought, wow, that's really amazing, but it might be a little hard to do it at the very beginning. So we decided to create an ionic diode uh, such that uh, no change in port diameter would occur. And we would achieve that based on entirely electrostatic interactions. So in order to create a diode or rectifier, we have to somehow break electrochemical symmetry of the system. And how we did it in this case, we created a junction. And one junction which we created within one pore is between a zone which carries positive surface charges. And next to it, we have zone which has negative surface charges. So the pores are quite small. So they are selective respectively for negative ions and positive ions. And then another uh, diode which you can also create with broken symmetry is when you have a junction between a part which has some sort of charges, either positive or negative, and a part which is neutral. And the rest is actually fairly simple. So um, you apply a voltage of one polarity, uh, the ions have a tendency to go out in this particular case, they are leaving, leaving the pore. You are creating a depletion zone, a region with very low concentration of ions, and consequently, that will create the off state of the device. And if you just switch the electrodes, uh, the current will flow, um, the ions will flow in the opposite direction. They are sourced from the bulk, and you create the on state of the device. Um, the current which you measure is a sum of the current carried by potassium by positive ions and negative ions. So the uh, so we knew what to do, but uh, the question which we had to solve is how to actually real how to actually make it happen. So here uh, the polymer pores turned out to be the perfect template to do that for two reasons. So the reason number one is that they have carboxyl groups on them, and uh, Every time we have carboxyl groups, it's a beautiful handle to the attachment for any molecule that you want. So the only thing which we had to do is to change some of the carboxyls into amines to get that junction between zones with opposite surface charges. Now, because of the carboxyls, we can create a peptide bond uh, using so-called ETC chemistry. And uh, that we can do by simply uh, placing the modifying agent on the, on the side of the pore of the narrow opening. Now, the conical shape was also extremely, ex extremely useful because if you place a modifying agent on one side and on the other side you have just water or you have a salt, uh, you are creating, you are, you are trying to solve a diffusion problem with the boundary conditions with some sort of concentration and then zero concentration on the other side. And only due to the conically shaped pore, the distribution of the concentration will be extremely nonlinear and it will be the highest only at the narrow opening. That's where the chemical reaction will occur. And the further away, the chemical reaction will not occur because the way how we perform the modification, the ETC is um, unstable after about an hour. So that very simple asymmetric uh, placement of the, of the chemicals allowed us to create systems which we thought would work as ionic diodes. So let me first show you how the conically shaped pores behave without doing anything to them. And that turns out to be an interesting effect or interesting system by itself, because as it turns out, if you have a conically shaped pore or a pipette and there are charges along them, uh, that system by itself is already a rectifier. So in our electrode configuration, uh, the, the negative currents, which are higher, correspond to potassium ions going from the small opening to the large opening of the pore. And, uh, and that's the on state of the device. However, 
uh, when you modify part of the port, part of the walls to amines, uh, you will see that the IV curve changed drastically. Here we have large negative currents. Here we have huge positive currents with rectification ratios, which reach even a few hundreds. Uh, we can also play the games and make the small opening negatively touched, and then you get IV curve, which is uh, which is just symmetric with respect to the beginning of coordinate system. Uh, the off state is really tiny, has just few tens of picoamp. Uh, the system, because the ports that we work with in this project are not that small, um, they're at least five nanometers in diameter. And that means that uh, we thought at least that the continuum modeling would be appropriate to try to figure out what's happening in the system. So we subjected the uh, our ionic diodes to Poisson and Splunk modeling and attempted to compare our ionic system with what's known from semiconductors. And um, the only thing which I want to mention on this slide is the fact that in, uh, that in uh, semiconductor devices is the doping, which determines what is the majority carrier. And in ionic devices is the surface chat, which really determines what happens in the system. But we were, uh, we were happy to see that similar to the space charge region in a PN junction, we also obtain um, a part with very low concentration of charge carriers, suggesting that a similar qualitatively at least effect of space charge occurred. In addition, um, in that junction, similar to what happens in a semiconductor system, we have the characteristic um, built-in um, electric potential difference. Uh, we also attempted uh, one-dimensional analytical formulas to describe um, how the ionic diode might, might behave. So on the left-hand side, um, there are famous formulas which describe uh, the PN junction. So you have a very strong exponential dependence of the current and voltage. Uh, in our case, uh, the formulas provided suggest that the dependence on of current on voltage is less steep, it's only parabolic, but we have a quite nice dependence. This is for radius. Uh, that's the diffusion coefficient. Delta C uh, carries information about the surface charge. Uh, so the higher surface charge, the higher the current, as well as length of the pore. Uh, one can also create uh, unipolar diodes, um, which as I mentioned, um, have the symmetry broken by creating a junction between a region with surface charges and a region with is neutral. Uh, that was for the first time shown in a group of uh, Aaron Madumdar. And um, intrinsically enough, um, you know, I keep saying that we are inspired by, um, by biology, but this particular group of Hagen Bailey uh, took alpha hemolysin bacterial pore and actually mutated it so strongly by adding a lot of charges that uh, they also created an ionic diode, which behaved like a switch in a very high uh, concentration of electrolyte. So the reason why, uh, why I like talking about, about this is that it's really, uh, I think these very simple experiments um, are showing how sensitive the transport properties are of nanopores to even very small modulations of the, of the surface charges. So our original um, idea or inspiration was the voltage gated channel, um, which does have the electromechanical gate. And um, ours, the ones which I showed you, they didn't. So we thought that maybe we could attempt to add an electro electromechanical gate to our ionic diodes and see whether we can achieve the same voltage dependent opening diameter. So it seemed at least at that time that a DNA a molecule would be the perfect candidate for an electromechanical gate because it's negatively charged. So it will respond to electric field. Uh, you can tune the length very precisely uh, by tuning the number of bases in your molecule. And as a bonus, as it turns out, DNA uh, conformation is also dependent on salt pretty drastically, uh, such that if you uh, put the DNA in a very diluted concentration of a salt, uh, the molecule will become uh, extended, even without application of electric field. 
Uh, so using the same conically shaped pores, the same um, approach of attachment of, of molecules to the pore walls, uh, we created a system in which we would have a pore which would be negatively charged naturally coming from carboxyl groups. But in addition, uh, using again the peptide chemistry, we attached uh, DNA molecules. Uh, we don't have one electromechanical gate like in biology, but we have many molecules uh, presumably attached at the, at the narrow opening. And because DNA is charged, then of course, if you, at, if you apply a voltage of one polarity, the molecules will have the tendency of deflecting away from that negatively biased electrode and block the opening of the pore, which we suspected might result in the occlusion of the pore opening. And, uh, and the diminishing the effective opening diameter. And then if you put the positive voltages, positive, uh, positively biased electron on this side, then the DNA will deflect towards it, um, opening, opening the pore. Uh, for subset of experiments, we chose DNA, um, which consisted only of two nucleotides, uh, cytosine and adenine. And the reason for it is that those two nucleotides have unusually high uh, pKa, so that if we lower the pH to pH by 5.5, some of the um, molecules would be proton would be uh, would be protonated, and that would presumably lead to the formation of the electrostatic mesh, as we called it, which would lock the uh, the pore in its closed state. So let's see what happened. Um, I will show you a part of the project which we did. So um, in the upper left uh, side corner, we have a um, we have an inset with current voltage curve shown for a uh, pore as prepared. Um, it was quite small. Um, the IV curve is uh, not that interesting. So the I mean um, the current is rectified as it normally is, with negative currents larger than positive currents. But after the attachment of DNA, things changed drastically. So first of all, um, if you look at the filled, um, filled circles, um, that curve was created when we scanned the voltage such that the DNA started uh, by occluding the small opening. And then as the voltage was changed, it became deflected in the opposite um, direction. And that IV curve is rectified in a way suggesting that um, the negative voltages, which before created an open state, now create the closed state of the pore, suggesting that DNA indeed block the pore for that voltage polarity. We did observe a very strong hysteretic behavior um, and that hysteresis, uh, we believe, stems from the fact that uh, when we scanned the voltage from positive voltages, so we scanned it starting with DNA molecules being deflected from the small opening, uh, because of the very small, very small space which is available in the pore, a larger voltage is required to make the DNA deflected um, such that they become uh, they they become oriented in such a way that the port opening is blocked. So that hysteresis was always present uh, when the DNA uh, pores were tested at pH 8. Uh, but interesting things happen when we lower the pH to pH 5.5. Again, we hypothesized that we would have this electrostatic mesh which would lock the pore in its closed state. And that seemed to be the case. The pore is rectifying in the opposite direction as we expected, but now we don't have the hysteresis suggesting that the DNA molecules have much less freedom to move around and change conformation uh, because they are interacting with each other electrostatically. So, um, so the ionic diode, the rectification has been uh, has been prepared by our people as well later in many different in many different materials, um, but still it seemed like the property of biological channels, which is really evasive, which is really hard to achieve in man-made system, is the selectivity, understood in a way that you would create a system which transports one type of cation, but does not transport another type of cation of the same valency. 
And um, presumably the most selective uh, biological channel is so-called voltage, uh, is, well, it's so-called potassium selective channel, which transports potassium even 10 times actually more efficiently than sodium. And in this particular um, uh, channel, it's um, if we if we are looking at at the sizes, right? So as a physicist, I'm always interested in how how large that is in the opening. It's a very small constriction. The selectivity filter is definitely less than one nanometer in diameter. It's so narrow that the that the ions have to get partially dehydrated to enter and get transported. And of course, the solvation is a very energetically expensive process, and it's. Um, energetically uh, worthwhile for potassium to, to do, but not uh, for sodium. So that system is, uh, is beautiful, uh, but it's very complicated. And we thought very hard to replicate directly. So what we thought to do instead, um, instead we thought to create um, a system which would transport potassium ions selectively uh, based on a different mechanism uh, which is uh, which is facilitated transport. So these experiments were done with silicon nitride pores. Uh, so the samples were much smaller. So we had to have a you know certain uh, PDMS conductivity cell to make sure that everything is tight. And um, in this particular case, we prepared the pores by an extremely convenient process to use so-called dielectric breakdown. It was actually um proposed invented by uh, by the canadian group of tabard casa and now uh, picked up by many groups around the world consider it to be the cheapest way of creating single nanopores so we did that too and uh, so now the pores are much shorter they're only 30 nanometers in length and um well, after preparation we were not happy again with the uh with the surface chemistry as much so we carboxylated um the whole chip so that we could again use the nice edc based chemistry to attach uh, molecules which uh, which which have amino group and the main player in the project was was crown ether uh, we chose a crown ether which is known to uh, selectively bind uh, potassium ion and not sodium ion, but we're not sure whether that selective binding will be uh, translated into selective transport. So we created two constructs. Um, the one uh, was simple. Uh, the crown ether was attached everywhere. It was symmetric uh, modification. And the other uh, was a little different. Uh, so one side of the pore was modified with the crown ethers. And then the other side of the pore was modified with DNA. But now the DNA was chosen such that statically it didn't fit inside the pore. So we suspected that the DNA would be only attached at the surface. So here is how we examined uh, the system. Uh, so we measured a lot of current voltage curves. Um, a, and each at each step of preparation, uh, the measurements were performed in potassium chloride and sodium chloride. And the selectivity in this particular case was quantified as a ratio of the currents in potassium chloride and in sodium chloride. So as prepared pore is not, uh, is not expected to be selective. The pores were a few nanometers in diameter, therefore no, no basis for them to be selective for um, any any types of cations. Um, they were selected for cations in general. And then after carboxylation, we did not see any specific potassium selectivity either. But interesting things started to happen when we looked at current voltage curve after crown ether attachment. So first of all, the first thing which was striking in both these constructs was a very, was finite, but suppressed transport of sodium chloride. So sodium chloride really didn't go through it very efficiently. And then the transport for potassium chloride seemed to be voltage dependent such that the current would pretty strongly depend, depend on the voltage, often in a nonlinear fashion, but it would be finer that it would be quite large. So the, the ratio of the currents was definitely a few tens. And uh, we were wondering um, why that is and uh, how we could how we could explain it. So first of all, let's think about how, how can these pores be selective for potassium? 
So our simplistic visual, visual, visualization of what's happening inside uh, would be uh, summarized in the form of this cartoon uh, when we have crown ethers attached to the pore walls. So presumably the, the potassium, if the, if the ions are transported close to the pore walls, uh, most the potassium would be uh, passing through. Uh, but if the pore is sufficiently large, then you will have a, a middle of the pore which would not be selective to anything. So yes, so this mechanism based on the facility to transport is also predicting a fairly strong dependence of the selectivity on pore opening. And then that's indeed what's happening. Uh, so the selectivity was uh, pretty obvious up to two nanometers in diameter for these pores, uh, but larger pores really did not um, distinguish between those two cations. Uh, we mostly studied the uh, pores which had both DNA and crown ether. These seem to be more selective, um, and we believe is because DNA cannot distinguish obviously between sodium and potassium, but this large negative surface charge in front of these pores um they already filter cations from an ion so the dna makes the pore cation selective and then the crown ether is making a distinction between uh, potassium and sodium we described the system using a phenomenological model developed actually in, in livermore by stephen baxbaum and uh, francesco fornaziero they assumed that the rate constants um, for binding of these two cations would be voltage dependent so they fitted the data, um, our ion current data at different concentrations and different voltages. And I guess the main output of the paper was to uh, quantify the rate constants of these ions in the, in the pore. And these results were surprising, to say the least. So if you look at the K-on, uh, then uh, the K-on for potassium seems to be 50 times higher than K-on for sodium, and that's that's good um that makes sense because it seems like the uh the pore is uh transporting better potassium than sodium what was however surprising is the k off so the k off for potassium is also quite high and uh we need a high k off for the transport to work here right if you want to if you want a system to be uh, selectively transporting something, we don't want these crown ethers to hang on on these ions for too long. But the K-off for sodium uh, was very low, and um, it was two, two orders of magnitude lower than sodium. And that made us aware that the sodium ions, they have a finite probability to bind to the crown ethers, and if they do, they uh, prevent other ions to pass through. So in some way, sodium plays the role of a blocker of the pore. Uh, so to confirm the, uh, the, uh, the findings based on the model, the hypothesis, um, and also inspired by reviewers who asked us to do that, uh, we worked with mixtures, which makes perfect sense. If you want to, if you want to claim that something is selective, um, working with mixtures would be crucial. Uh, so we created mixtures of potassium chloride and sodium chloride in such a way uh, that the concentration of these cations would be the same, uh, but, but we would change the ratio. So for example, um, in those graphs, which were obtained for positive voltages and negative voltages, uh, we are showing current, which is the open squares, and the estimated selectivity, which is the filled, the blue filled squares. So the one would correspond to only potassium and the zero would correspond to only sodium chloride. So you can see that adding 20% of sodium really tanks the current drastically and the selectivity as well. So the selectivity is definitely the highest if you study these, these, these two salts separately. But we're happy to see that even if you work at 50% of potassium chloride and 50% of sodium chloride, the selectivity is still finite. So still the, uh, the pore is transporting potassium ions few times more efficiently than, um, than, than sodium ions, suggesting that the selectivity is still there. So the future studies 
uh, we would like to continue working with different crown ifers um, and hopefully find a crown ifer which would be capable of uh, binding molecules which are at the very low concentration and filter them out from water. Uh, this project also made us aware that um, whatever values we can see for binding in bulk, which are obviously available in the literature, they might not be the same when you put them in a nanopore, because suddenly even the concentration starts losing its normal meaning if there is a place only for a, for a few ions. And it could be that the, that the interactions in the, in the constricted volume would be quite different. Uh, so, um, and I will finish off with the project which we are, which we are performing as we speak. Um, I'm really excited by that because here we talk not only about ions, but we also talk about solvent. And uh, in all the slides which I showed you so far, uh, the focus was on the ions. We are looking at ions, we are looking at molecules, we are trying to control them. But everything was happening in the unspoken dielectric medium, which we did not control. It was always there. Uh, maybe, maybe there was electrosmotic transport, but we did not take that into account. And even if we did, it would not change drastically the, uh, the semi-quantitative um, conclusions. But what we tried to do is that what if we created a gate for water? And if we create a gate for water, you will create a gate for water and all dissolve in its species. So if you wanted to stop, uh, let's say, diffusion or make the even diffusion transport on off, uh, you would be able to do that. So here the inspiration came from modeling, um, which was performed a while back. Uh, it was performed, for example, in the, um, in the groups uh, of Mark Sansom and Alan Kaluzar. And what they uh, looked at, they looked at a nanoscopic structure, which would be filled with, which would be decorated with hydrophobic groups. Uh, so it's very hydrophobic, it's very greasy. And what they looked at, they looked at the uh, water density in that pore as a function of time. And they realized that the liquid water is very unstable. There are instances of time when the pore is filled with liquid water, but there are instances of time when the density of water is so low that it actually suggests that the pore is filled with vapor. So that would correspond to the perfect off state where nothing would be able um, to pass through. So if I think about, you know, okay, so uh, this picture is, um, is a little, you know, it's interesting, but what I would like to do is to, is to be able to control it, right? So to make a system which would be entirely filled with liquid water and then maybe entirely filled with vapor for time scales which are which are important for measurements. So when we think about hydrophobic pores, um, typically the first stimulus which comes to our mind is pressure difference. So if you look at our pores in, in raincoats or umbrellas, they are microscopic, so they are quite large. They are hydrophobic and then for the water to go in, uh, quite large pressure has to be applied. So if we, you know, came to Florida in a hurricane category three, we would be wet. And that, uh, even in the rain cold, and that, uh, that process is considered irreversible. So once you push the water in, uh, the water will be filled in even after removal of that pressure difference. But for nanoscopic pores, when it's very, when the pore is very tiny, uh, less than 10 nanometers in diameter, First of all, you need enormous pressures uh, to fill the pore, even for modest contact angle. But it's predicted that if you remove the, the pressure difference, then the pore would go back towards the wetted state. So it would be a beautiful on-off uh, system. We uh, didn't want to work with pressure difference, uh, partly because the pressure which you need to apply would be very high. And some of the membranes are not capable of, of withstanding such a high pressure difference. So instead, we went back to electric field. As it turns out, um, not only can you um, make a pore wet with pressure difference, but you can also do it with electric field. There are different physical mechanisms which are given as a possibility why that happens, but some of them is the alignment of uh, water dipoles when electric field is applied, which leads to change of the local contact angle. And even um, scientists talk about electrostriction. 
So what we hypothesize is that if we would have a nanopore, which is small, um, and without, without electric field, it would not be wet, uh, but after application of some, um, some uh, presumably threshold value of electric field, we would force the water in. So I want to show you the newest results which we obtained with that. And, um, and I'm very curious what you think about it. It's still, it's a topic which is, um, which I'm still learning a lot about, about that. So these experiments were also done with silicon nitride. And uh, in this particular case, they were done both with dielectric breakdown pores as well as pores drilled by uh, electron beam and TEM. So uh, again, we created two types. Um, in one type, we were simple, so we modified everything with hydrophobic silanes. The pores were quite, quite hydrophobic. The contact angle was above 100 degrees. And uh, these pores, which were entirely hydrophobic, um, unfortunately, were not super interesting because um, as prepared, they, they, they obviously um, it transduced a lot of current, transported a lot of current, but after, after that hydrophobic modification, we were mostly observing the pore in its closed state. There was no current whatsoever. Um, if you look at your picoammeter, it seems like um, they are not really connected. And it seems like it would suggest that we have that the pore volume is filled with vapor. For the reason I will ex explain in a moment, we also studied potassium bromide and potassium iodide, and that did not change the, the system at all. But what we did do also is we created another asymmetric um, nanopore such that one opening would be again greasy, um, uh, obtained by the same hydrophobic uh, salinization, but the other opening would be in contact or would be modified with polyelectrolyte. Uh, we chose two types of polyelectrolytes, but here it's a it's a it's a polycationic electrolyte. And that system was uh, much more interesting. Um, when you look at the IV curve after uh, after those two modifications, you will see that the positive voltages are still blocked. Um, it seems like there is no current occurring in potassium chloride. But as we switch the if we um, if we if 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 we scan the voltage to larger negative voltages, we can see that there is a threshold voltage at which the current does, um, does start to be finite. There is also a, a hysteretic effect. So the voltage at which that wetting transition occurs depending on the, uh, on the direction of scan. Uh, we look at the potassium, um, uh, we, um, we look at the positive voltages and we're trying to see, is there a condition? Is there a salt? which will cause the port to be open for all voltages. And it turned out that the key uh, was to use a different salt. So for, so for potassium bromide and for, and for potassium iodide, the same pores which showed that um, perfect diode behavior in KCL became entirely open in those two salts. So again, that, uh, that diode is a diode which um, stops transports of water and dissolves in its species. Uh, so we did confirm that with our pores, so the fact that the pores would be closed in chloride salts, but opened in bromide and iodide was reproducible with our pores. And the reason why we chose this large polarizable anions as a possibility to open the pores for transport actually came uh, from knowledge on water-air interface. It has been suggested by quite a few groups that the properties of the water-air interface are quite similar to the properties of the hydrophobic surface liquid interface. And it was found that these large um, uh, polarizable anions like iodide, they actually like sitting on the interface between water and air. And we suspected that maybe they also like sitting close to the uh, hydrophobic uh, part of the pore, enabling uh, wetting the pore. I also want to mention that these, uh, just to give you a glimpse of some of the data in uh, potassium chloride, um, when the pores were not entirely open, we saw quite often very drastic transition between uh, closed state and open state. Um, it was voltage dependent, but in potassium iodide, uh, the IV curve recorded was such that 
uh, the port was conductive uh, for all for all voltages. In order to uh, provide evidence or to see whether these large polarizable anions indeed can get accumulated at a hydrophobic surface, um, we work with our collaborators in Livermore, with Dr. Ann Pam and uh, Fikret Aydin. And what they uh, modeled, they created a system uh, in which they looked at uh, distribution of ions close to the hydrophobic surface, which is shown here by the uh, with the pale uh, dotted uh, green line, and uh, they are showing density of both ions, positive and negative, uh, with respect to bulk. So this is for potassium chloride, potassium bromide, and potassium iodide. And we're really pleased uh, to see that for the potassium iodide, for the largest polarizable anion that we uh, probed, there is a large peak of these large anions close to the surface. And it almost reminds me of a double layer structure, even though it's not a typical double layer structure because we presumably do not have any surface charges. But that propensity of the iodide to move uh, towards the uh, hydrophobic surface stems from the, uh, from the unusual um, solvation structure of, uh, of iodide ions. Uh, that's something which we are still trying to figure out and we are working as we speak. Um, so yes, we do have the very strong uh, salt dependent and also the voltage dependent. But once you put electrolyte uh, to the surface, you might also think about uh, controlling the wetting, the wetting transition with salt concentration, which would modify the, um, the uh, interaction. So it seems to be that a little bit unusually, we see um, easier wetting with higher salt concentration, which is exactly the opposite of what one would expect from surface tension experiments. So um, I hope that I uh, convey the message that, you know, having nanopores, especially having one nanopore, um, is a really a good model system to understand what's happening inside. And again, the, the main, um, I think, um, plus of having or advantage of having one nanopore is that the signal which you obtain of the ion current, which is very sensitive to what's happening inside, you can relate directly with the one structure of the pore, with one nanopore, which you know how it looks like. And uh, we are very excited about making ion selective nanopores, and uh, we hope to continue our uh, studies on the hydrophobic uh, interactions. So uh, I'm very happy to take in the questions and we'll pause with the slides showing faces of people who are actually behind all that research. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Susanna, that was fantastic. I'm jealous how clean your uh, studies are with these really well-defined pores and, and measurements, the kinds of things we do with membranes with many pores and all the dispersity in that system is just much more complex to, to sort it all out. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of questions for you here. We won't have time for them all, so I'm going to uh, take the moderator's prerogative and just kind of pick the ones that I'm most interested in. Uh, so uh, first one would be um, your schematics are all showing, uh, flat surfaces for the pore walls. And uh, the question is, what role does roughness play on ion transport, if any? Uh, it's a good question. Yes, our pores are rough. And um, especially polyethylene terephthalate pores are rough because they are semi-crystalline. Um, I think that, yes, the roughness um, is probably influencing the transport somewhat. But I think that because the pore, the, the pore which are studying are at least five nanometers in diameter, I think that, um, uh, that the models which are provided are okay semi-quantitatively, but it might be that the roughness is in is inducing some interesting uh, fluid flow, like maybe some more nonlinear electrosmotic effects, which we which we do not account for. But that's a very good um, good uh, good question. How that how that works? Yeah. So to that kind of topic about electroosmosis, and you referenced it a little bit uh, while you were speaking. 
There's a question is, uh, have you looked at concentration differences across the pore that may give rise to diffusio osmosis transport? Mm, interesting question. Uh, so the answer is no, we have not looked at it yet. Uh, we would like to look at it because that would be, um, I know that people were using it, I think, for concentrating species or maybe to put species in a different, uh, no, so we haven't looked at it, but it would be fascinating. A very good suggestion, yeah. Um, so you showed some uh, really cool results with those potassium selective pores. Uh, wondering if you've worked on selectivity of monovalent anions, for example, chloride over bromide. No, we have not worked yet. Um, I'm thinking that maybe the selectivity for anions would be easier because anions are larger. So <laughs> maybe it would be easier. But now we have not looked at uh, yet. It would be uh, the, fir the first, I think, question to answer would be um, what we would base the selectivity on, right? We would have to find a molecule or something, a group which is binding one ion better than the other ion. So that's an interesting question. Thanks. Um, another one. Uh, so you mentioned pH a few times, but have you tried adjusting pH on those ion rectifying systems uh, as you shift through the isoelectric point of the pore, pore wall material to see if you can see the you know, change in behavior as you pass that point? Oh yeah, so uh, we did that with, um, with different pores. So let's say that, um, let's see, um, I can I can answer what we did and also what uh, what other people did. So what we did, we if you take let's say the um, uh, the polymer pore which have which has only carboxyl groups, if you go with pH lower to the isoelectric point of the surface, you have an ohmic behavior. Um, and the closer you are to the isoelectric point, the less rectifying the pore is. And then when you pass it, when you go even lower with pH. Um, we believe there is actually a uh, absorption of protons and you get rectification in the opposite direction. So our people did that with um, decorating the pore walls with proteins of known isoelectric point. And then they, and they can actually correlate that at the PA, that the pH which correlates with the isoelectric point of the protein which they attached, they had a beautiful ohmic behavior and the negative or positive surface charges were, um, uh, resulted in the inverse current voltage curves. Great. So some people use the rectification degrees um, and the switch of rectification direction as the mean to detect uh, molecules from the solution which have chemical affinity to the groups which they attached. Um, okay, I'm going to try and squeeze in uh, two more here if I can. Uh, so uh, one that just came in uh, is an interesting question kind of about how you uh, draw inspiration for what materials you use to coat your pores. The question is, have you looked to styrene divinyl benzene based ion exchange resins and the various functional groups to provide to guide your research in choosing compounds to help tune selectivity? Targets mm, no, we have not. Um, we have not. That would be an interesting. I mean, honestly, uh, the uh, the inspiration in you know, in the first part uh, of the talk, we wanted to be very simple, right? We just wanted to switch negative surface charges into positive surface charges. And we were attaching uh, just the amines uh, for a molecule, which was as small as possible, which would not change the effective pore opening, right? Because we didn't want to have the system more complicated. But yes, we are very open to uh, collaborations and to suggestions because our, you know, chemical imagination is finite and we are always happy to work with people who know more about chemistry than we do. Thank you. All right, one more, and then, uh, and then we'll uh, talk about the next, the next seminar. So um, regarding the, the last set of experiments you showed, um, the anion difference in the wetting, de-wetting behavior may also be partially due to different hydration energies as chloride and bromide have similar hydrated radius. And so I, I'm not sure if there's a question there. I guess it's a, a, a suggestion. Yeah, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good, uh, good point. Um, I think our collaborators, and they would, they would probably give a much better answer to this question than I do. They actually look at the solvation um, of these anions 
and they um, and they found a correlation. So 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 they basically realized that these large polarizable anions do not have such a well defined salvation energy, so um, um, salvation shell, and that presumably makes the um, anions more hydrophobic and more likely to go to those hydrophobic surfaces, which our smaller ions are avoiding. But yes, that certainly is um, that certainly is the case. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, let me grab the screen so I can bring this back up. Hopefully you can all see that. This is um, uh, the QR code uh, corresponding to our next Third Coast Water Seminar, which will be the last Wednesday in May. And we'll have uh, Lutgard Raskin from the University of Michigan giving a presentation on researcher utility partnerships for advancing microbial drinking water quality. Uh, so, um, Please do register for that one. And yet another um, interesting topic. Um, thank you so much, Susanna, for a really cool uh, seminar. This, um, there were another, uh, I, you only got half the questions that popped up. So uh, lots of interest from the audience. Um, you will all see that a, uh, a poll just popped up on your screen. Um, please do go ahead and um, give us a response to that as we're trying to um, get a sense for what um, our audience is, is most interested in as we progress through the Third Coast Water Seminar Series. So thanks again to our speaker today, to my fellow uh, organizers, and to all of you for attending, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.